Hello, I'm Dawn. I am a uh, volunteer for the Natural Land Institute. I'm also a uh, master naturalist and a volunteer here at Kieselberg uh, Forest Preserve. And uh, Kieselberg Forest Preserve is one of my favorite prairies because it has this big, beautiful prairie here. Um, and when I think of prairies, I think of not only the um, beautiful grasses and wildflowers that live here, but also the other animals that, that live here and call it home as well. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about who lives in the prairie. And one of my favorite memories of being here at Kieselberg is a day when I encountered a coyote. I was hiking on the trails and I was lucky enough to have my binoculars with me. So I was able to uh, watch it patrolling through the prairie, searching for its next meal. It was really magnificent and really beautiful. So we'll talk a little bit more of who else lives here. Um, I don't think that you could visit a prairie without seeing something fluttering or running or slithering or flying around. A prairie is an ecosystem that is dominated by tall grasses and wildflowers called forbs. And all of the inhabitants of the prairie take advantage of all of the special things that a prairie has to offer. For example, the soils are very fertile, so it supports a wide variety of plants that are herbivores, can come eat, and the insects um, can pollinate and visit and, and use for food. In addition, all of those insects that are supported by the prairie are also eaten by um, the birds and the other animals that eat the insects. A prairie also has very tall grasses and, and plants that help the small animals um, hide and take shelter um, from predators and from the elements. And also it provides places for animals to burrow. And so they can escape from predators, they can raise their young in those burrows, and they can also escape the elements that way. So you can literally find birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and insects in a prairie. There are hundreds of species of animals. And if you were to travel back into the 1700s, you would see large grazing animals like the American bison and the North American elk who would travel in large herds and graze on the prairie. And so sadly, there are very few places where you can see a bison today due to lack of habitat. Um, there are also other animals that are no longer common today um, in the prairie, such as different birds like the upland sandpiper and the short-eared owl and the greater prairie chicken. And there are also reptiles and amphibians that are threatened or endangered today due to lack of habitat. So let's talk about adaptations. So an adaptation is a part of an animal's body or a behavior that helps them survive in its habitat. So a great example of that is a bison who has really large flat teeth that help it to grind and chew on those grasses that it's eating. And it also has a digestive system that is specially adapted to process those grasses. Another example might be the camouflage that a grasshopper would use. So a grasshopper is a beautiful color of green and it's that same color as the grasses and the other plants around it. So it can literally hide in plain sight and escape predators um, from finding it. Another adaptation is something that you can find in animals like badgers or voles or ground squirrels. They have paws and legs that are specially adapted to be very strong so they can dig and burrow into the ground. And so in fact, a badger is able to burrow right through concrete if it needed to. So Another um, adaptation that animals need to use today is the ability to live in a smaller area than they historically had to. So now that most of Illinois has been settled and converted into farmland, the animals have to live in smaller areas of the prairie or sometimes they might even live in the farmland itself. So as with any habitat, you're going to find different relationships between all of the animals that live there. So one great example might be a predator-prey relationship. So think of that coyote or an owl who is the predator and maybe a mouse that would be the prey where one animal eats the other. Another relationship you might find is one where um, a butterfly or a moth or a beetle has larvae that only eat certain kinds of plants. And so a very common popular example of that would be the monarch butterfly. Its caterpillar, which is the larva of the monarch butterfly, 
only eats one type of plant, and I bet some of you can think of what that type of plant is. It's the milkweed. You think you're picky? My kid only eats milkweed, and that's darn hard to shop for. <laughs> so in your activity today, you're going to go out and explore, and you're going to find evidence that an animal used a habitat um, by looking around and finding some of that evidence that it leaves behind. So I went into my own backyard and I found some examples that you might find helpful to help you get at some ideas. So for example, this little um, ball right here is something I found on a goldenrod plant. And so this is an old stem of a goldenrod. And a fly came along and landed on this little stem and laid its eggs. And when it laid its eggs, um, the larva formed right inside this little ball and when it's ready it would emerge out as an adult fly. And that's another example of a very special relationship because that fly only lays its eggs on the goldenrod plant. Another example is this little wasp nest that I found and don't worry nobody lives there anymore and of course we should never approach a wasp nest if somebody's living inside of it but this is an old one that I found by my house and so you can tell that a wasp was living next to my house a whole colony and this piece of bark I turned it over and underneath the bark there's lots of little designs and patterns on this bark and that tells me that a beetle was living underneath the bark and they would chew through the bark and make these beautiful little designs so I know that there were beetles living here. And when I was walking through my backyard I saw a stem that had a cocoon on it. And this cocoon is from a giant silk moth and so the caterpillar from the giant silk moth spun this beautiful little cocoon and when it's ready it would emerge and become this beautiful silk moth that would come out. So you can tell that there was a silk moth visiting here. And then of course many of you would find nests in your yard or you might see a robin that's making a nest by your house. And so you can find birds nests or even squirrels nests in the trees. You can find nests in the grass or um, even in the bushes. And this one's my favorite. This is an oriole nest and it's a, like a little woven basket that hangs from the trees and it's in a little teardrop shape. So I just think it's beautiful. This one fell out of the tree and nobody's using it anymore. So I thought this was a great example. And then also when I was looking in my backyard, I saw a trail that was worn down by the animals. And so I put up a trail camera to see who was there. And so we found that there were coyotes and possums and raccoons and deer and turkeys all using the same trail, traveling back and forth and wearing down that trail so I can see where they've been. Most of it, they did it all at night, so I didn't even know that they were there. So I hope you found those examples useful. And now it's time for you to go out and explore and see what you can find in your backyard or a park or another area to find where animals were living. So I hope you enjoy Family Nature Day and I hope you learned something new. Thank you.